We are really excited to have the creator of the Redeeming Productivity podcast and the brand new book, Reagan Rose. Hello and welcome, Reagan. Hey, welcome. It's great to be here. Oh, thank you. Reagan, this may feel a bit like you're giving me a, a therapy session today. I love your podcast and lack that bit of a brain that you've been clearly blessed with. In case anyone listening hasn't been in contact with you or your work before, please feel free to introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. So my name is Reagan Rose. I'm the creator of Redeeming Productivity, which is a media ministry which explores personal productivity from a Christian worldview for the glory of God. So basically, I'm trying to help believers get more done, but do so with an eternal perspective and according to biblical principles. And I also have a, a new book coming out, which is also called Redeeming Productivity. Um, and that's out October 4th with Moody Publishers and kind of dives even deeper into the subject. Uh, excellent. We'll make sure that we've got a link both to your podcast and to your new book in the description below. Was that done for SEO purposes, Reagan? I know you're into your your media, the book <laughs> and the, the podcast. You basically own that that phrase now, right? <laughs> On the internet. Yeah, I guess so. You know, it's funny. It was actually the publisher's idea to call it that. I, I pitched a different idea and they're like, why don't you call it, just call it Redeeming Productivity. I said, okay, that's fine by me. <laughs> well, if it's not broken, don't fix it, right? That's right. <laughs> When did you become a Christian, Reagan? And how did you get involved with working on the digital platforms with both John MacArthur and now I know you're a part of a team with Costi Hinn at For the Gospel? Yeah, sometimes I have to pinch myself because it's such a, it, I can't believe how many different opportunities the Lord's given me. But um, I, so I got saved, actually. Lord graciously drew me to himself when I was a young child. I had the privilege of uh, two believing parents and they uh, were preaching the gospel to me from a very young age. And they they had the privilege too, I guess, of leading me to Christ. And uh, I took sort of a circuitous route to get into um, talking about the Bible and, and things like this. I didn't think I was ever going to teach the Bible. I certainly didn't think I was going to teach productivity. So I um I actually went to school. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in film and animation. And so while I was doing that, I actually put myself through school by doing web development. So I've always been like into computers and media and that kind of stuff. But I never really put it together until um, later in life. After I was finishing college, I really just had a desire to teach the Bible. And I started leading a college ministry at my church. And in the midst of that, kind of became convicted, you know, I really should get some more training if I'm going to teach the Bible. And so I went to seminary at the Master's Seminary, which is, uh, is the seminary connected with John MacArthur and Grace Community Church out there in California. And I thought I was leaving behind the media, the web development, the film, all of that stuff. I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm pivoting. I'm going to be a, a pastor. That kind of, that's, that was just a, a, a side quest I was on, but that's, I'm leaving behind. The Lord had different plans for me and, and through just his, his grace, his mercy towards me, I, I ended up getting to work at Grace to You, which is John MacArthur's media ministry, overseeing digital platforms. So I was putting to use all of these different things, all these different experiences and stuff that the Lord had given me as I grew up, the web development, even some of the stuff with with film and video and communications and technology. And so that was just an amazing experience. And then as I was leaving there to to um, come back to my home state of Michigan to be closer to family, Costi Hinn was launching a ministry for the gospel or sort of relaunching it. And he asked me to help with that. And so even as I was I was literally moving the day that we launched the website for that. So it was pretty, pretty intense. Um, so I helped them get that off the ground. And now I'm a contributor to it here and there. I'm not as involved as I was when it was first launching, um, because now I'm focusing most of my time on for the gospel. But yeah, it's just a, a story of God's faithfulness, his mercy, how he kind of ties together the different strands in our lives that we don't really expect are connected. Yeah, amazing. That's really good. I, I first came into contact with your work, and a lot of our listeners would have done as well, for a mutual friend that we have in Nate Pickowitz. How did you become the go-to guy in the reformed Christian world for everything to do with productivity? And have you always been super organized, Reagan? Well, I was just first want to say I love Nate Pickowitz. He's such an awesome, awesome guy yeah. and a good brother. Um, I think, I don't know if I'm the go-to guy. I want to be the go-to guy because <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's kind of the the thing I'm, I'm most interested in is 
understanding productivity from a Christian worldview. But I think in the reformed world, it's just sort of the circles I was running in, the people I knew, the people I was connected to, the people that most influenced my thought were reformed thinkers. And so as I approach this subject of productivity, which is, you know, been heavily analyzed and and thought about and discussed in the secular world, I'm trying to come at it with a really rigorous biblical worldview. I'm bringing my reformed faith with me. I'm I'm trying to tear down this thing to the studs and see, okay, how can we rebuild our understanding of what it means to be productive as Christians, but doing it with a high view of God's sovereignty, of uh, understanding the doctrines of grace, um, how, how the gospel really works, how God works in our lives. And so that's kind of just been the area that I've worked in. But um, to answer your question, have I always been super organized? Not at all, <laughs> actually. Really? Um, as a young man, before I got into um, doing college ministry, I was actually incredibly, ridiculously addicted to video games. I so much so I was I was staying up multiple nights, like all night in a row. I was neglecting responsibilities in life, like I I could not stop myself. And it was really as the Lord was working in my heart this desire to teach his word, I, I kind of realized and was convicted, I need to get my act together. And so that's what actually started me down the path of, at first, just studying productivity with what was out there, which was secular books. And it was through that study that I eventually said, you know what, I think I think we need to go deeper with this as Christians and not just take wholesale what the, the secular world is saying about productivity. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that you've mentioned the secular world because it's so important, isn't it, to be talking about productivity and and it's important that we don't just frame this as a secular activity that doesn't concern Christians, right, Reagan? That's right, exactly. Um, I think that when even the name of my ministry, Redeeming Productivity, is kind of the idea of I want to buy back the concept of productivity from the world. I think it's ours. And I stumbled across this great quote from R.C. Sproul. I think it's in his uh, commentary on John. He says, our calling as Christians is the highest calling there is. And the idea of being productive is not the invention of capitalism. It is the mandate of Christ. And I just, I have that pasted plastered everywhere because I think that's so good. Productivity is not the invention of capitalism. It's not, you know, people think of productivity, you think of the like factories, the industrial revolution or, or workplace productivity, you know, timing your tasks and trying to organize all everything. But really, if you tear it back, productivity is a Christian concept. Productivity is about fruitfulness. I get into this in the book that a lot of our, our ideas of productivity are influenced by the industrial revolution and sort of this mechanical view of it, that productivity is about if it's purely about efficiency, getting as much done in as little time as possible. But if you go back before the Industrial Revolution, when people would have talked about productivity, they would talk about um, fruitfulness. I, I don't know what they they call it on, on your side of the pond, but when you go to the grocery store here and you go to the place where they have the fruits and vegetables, it's called the produce section. Yeah, it's, same. Yeah, to, yeah, right. it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to yeah. be productive means to bear much fruit. And so you know, you think of John 15, five, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. I love that. But you're, you're bearing fruit, but it's not just a little, you're being productive, you're bearing much fruit. And he goes on to say, for apart from me, you can do nothing. So I, I really think the concept of fruitfulness as a Christian is a big part. When I think about productivity, I'm thinking of how do I, how do I bear fruit for Christ? But I'm also thinking about, um, stewardship, you utilizing my time, utilizing my resources as wisely as possible. And part of that's time management, but it's, it's a whole, it's all about stewarding your entire life for God's glory. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. It's, 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 it's about stewarding isn't it, our lives that the Lord has given us. How can we make sure that we glorify God in how we manage our time and how much free time for doing the things that we enjoy is actually okay, Reagan? That's a great question. Um, I, I, I think, you know, the very start of it is recognizing that time is a stewardship. I think that's where it begins is, is really wrapping your head around that, that this life is not my own. You know, the scripture says your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Suddenly you actually have this mental shift of, wait, it's not my time. It's not, okay, when I punch out at the end of the day from my job, 
now it's all my time. It's no, the, the time while you're punched in and the time while you're punched out, the time while you're asleep, all of it's God's. It's on loan to you from him. And that puts this, this responsibility on you that makes you start looking at the world differently. Um, so I think, I think time stewardship comes from just that recognition that, yeah, it really is a stewardship. But I also think to, to answer the the broader question of, you know, how, how much time, free time for doing things we enjoy is okay. How much, how do we manage that? I think that, um, I think that our definition of productivity has to be broader. Like, I think I I hear questions like that a lot. Like, the people feel like if I'm not working, I'm not being productive. But I think as Christians, if you understand productivity as stewardship, you start to view it as much more holistic. My recreation, my rest time is also a stewardship. You know, we have this from the very beginning that um, the Lord gave us the Sabbath. Uh, the Lord uh, has instructed us to rest. He there's There's so many things, especially in the Psalms, about enjoying creation, enjoying the things God's given us. That too is a stewardship. And so I think when you expand your definition of stewardship or of productivity to include stewarding everything from from your time to your health to your finances to your spiritual life to your recreation, you start to see that it is not um, this burdensome thing, burdensome thing where sometimes you're you're on and you're being as efficient as possible, and sometimes you're just laying back. It's in all of those times you're doing whatever your your hand comes to do. You're doing it all for the glory of God. Yeah, so good. So good. I, I know I've heard you talk a number of times um, on your podcast. I know you mentioned this in your book as well about the five pillars of Christian productivity. What are these and how should we apply them in our lives, Reagan? Yeah. So as as I've gone through and tried to sort of, well, de- I was going to say deconstruct, but that's not really a good word these days to use, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to sort of tear down the concept of productivity and and understand what are the points where uh, a theology comes in that that's really the 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 base level principles these these foundational principles and I've come up with these these five that I think really change your outlook on productivity and they all have to do with us and our relationship to God. So the first one is that you belong to God, which I kind of just talked about with the stewardship thing. Your life's not your own. And so that's sort of the origin of our desire to be productive. Right. I want yeah. to be productive, not because, you know, the world says you want to be productive so you can be rich, so you can be famous, so people will like you. But I want to be productive because it's not my life, because I want to serve the Lord with my life. Uh, the second one is that you exist to glorify God. And that's sort of the purpose for our productivity. I, I'm here to bring God glory. I have a mission in this life. It's not just about my own self-satisfaction. I have a, a life that's aimed at something um, that is of ultimate importance. The third one is you were saved to bear fruit for God. So we sort of talked about this. This is the content of productivity. So what is it I'm to be productive in? Bearing fruit. So the world says, you know, be productive in following your dreams. The Bible says be productive in following Christ, doing those things which please him. Uh, the fourth one is you have been uniquely gifted by God. And so this is sort of the source of our productivity, the the power source that God has given us all that we need to bear that fruit for him through our connection to him, through our spiritual gifts, through the indwelling spirit, through the church, through all the means of grace. Um, we can't be productive in our own power. And I think that's a huge divergence from the way the world talks about it. It's kind of like pull yourself up by your bootstraps you know, get all the, get your systems all in order, you know, be really disciplined and that, and that is going to do it. Now, those things are important, but that's ultimately not our power source. We can only be productive in the things that please God by relying on his power. And the the fifth and final uh, pillar of Christian productivity is you will give an account to God. And this I see as the, the ultimate motivation for being productive. It's not about trying to get some temporal success. It's not about being productive for a little while so I can, you know, retire at 35 or something. It's my motivation is I'm going to stand before my Lord. And this is a positive motivation. It's talking about believers when that we meet Christ and that that judgment unto reward. You know, you you look at Matthew 25 and the the parable of the talents and he, he speaks to the two faithful stewards in that parable and says, well done, good and faithful steward. Uh, you have been faithful a little, with a little. I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. I 
want that. And that motivates me day after day to, by his power, with, with an understanding of his grace, you know, seated firmly in the gospel, but but just striving to live a life that really does honor him, knowing that I am I'm going to meet him one day face to face. And I want to uh, have lived a life that that mattered, that brought him glory. Yeah, so good. So good. The frustrating thing about your new book and maybe your podcast to a lesser extent <laughs> is that the people that actually need to read or listen to your podcast from most probably think that they're too busy and don't have the time to do so. What are some telltale signs that someone needs to address their productivity, Reagan? I think just what you said, I, I actually hear that so often. I was chuckling as you asked the question because it really is the catch-22. The people that really need this kind of stuff are are often the people that are so busy, their, their lives are so overwhelmed, they don't feel like they have the time to hit pa the pause button and really learn how to get things organized and steward their time. I think that really is one of the biggest telltale signs that someone needs to address it, which is kind of counterintuitive because a lot of times you think of, well, productivity, that's for people who are like lazy, they're not doing much, they need to learn to be more productive. I think that's that's true too. I mean, that was my case with the video game addiction and, and all of that. But I think it's equally important for people that are overwhelmed and overly busy that productivity doesn't just mean doing more things. It means being much more focused and intentional and doing the right things and doing them well and doing them in, in the right way. And so I, I do think that that if someone's saying, I don't have enough time, that's I want to I want to grab him by the collar and say, no, you need to stop everything. <laughs> take yeah. take a little bit of time, learn these things, and you're going to catch up and more with whatever time you lost to to learn this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So good. Zeal and enthusiasm, if not channeled properly, can lead to burnout, can't it? What are some great tips for staying on top form without killing yourself in the process? Great question. Yeah, I think a big one, this is kind of obvious, but especially if you're given to productivity and this kind of stuff, don't sacrifice sleep. Now, I, I'm i an early riser, but I'm only an early riser because I'm early to bed. I go to bed really early. I go to bed earlier than most people's grandparents. <laughs> um, and the only reason I do that is because I'm not giving up sleep. You know, there's a lot of sometimes in talking about productivity, there's a lot of macho type thing. Like, yeah. you know, if you want to get more done, you're just going to have to sleep less. That is not a recipe for longevity. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes the pressure's on and you do need to give up some sleep. But as a strategy for life, that is going to kill you. That's going to lead to burnout. That's going to net you a much less productive life than if you paced yourself and really got the sleep you needed each night. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing, which I've sort of alluded to, is don't cut off your fuel supply. And what I mean is, as a Christian, I'm I'm still doing this, constantly have to reorient myself, that being productive, ultimately, if the ultimate objective is to glorify God with my life, then the, the prime directive, the prime thing I need to be working on is making sure I'm walking closely with Christ. And it's so easy to let that slip, to to not be in prayer each day, to not be in the word. But a, if everything else doesn't get done today, but you walked with the Lord, that was a productive day. And so I think having that attitude that that is, if I have that baseline, that's going to be the fuel supply. That's going to be the thing that actually helps me lead a productive life in every other area. So you got to start there. And then the last thing I would add is uh, this has worked really well for me. Yeah, someone who maybe has often over indexed on trying to like cram every moment with stuff. I have what I call a minimum viable schedule. So it's just, I have a few things that are at the top of my list, a few activities. And one of them is, um, you know, spending time with the Lord in prayer and, and reading scripture each day. But if I do those things, I count it as a productive day. So even if everything else is not working and today just feels like a waste. If I did yeah. these this few things on my schedule, I'm going to count it as a good day and I'm not going to beat myself up about it. And so th those are just a few things that I think help stave off the burnout while still getting a lot done. Yeah, so helpful. Thank you. One of the things that I struggle with is saying no, even when I'm already on my knees and super busy. Why is this a problem and how do you deal with that personally? Yeah, this is a big problem for me too. Um, I talk a lot uh, about overcommitment 
because it's something I do struggle with. And I, I think it is a problem because our our Christian lives, the 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 mark we leave, what we do here is in large measure going to be a result of what we focused on. And what happens when you focus on too many things is you don't make measurable progress in anything. And so having a focus to your life is really important. But if you are a people pleaser, which I am, you, saying yes to everything that comes your way ends up diluting your productive energy such that you're not making progress on maybe the thing that God has really called you to. And so this is a hard thing because for Christians, especially, you know, you know, we're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to be a servant of all. And so what does that mean? Doesn't that mean saying yes to everything? But you look at Jesus' life. He didn't say yes to everything. He was a man on a mission. He did allow himself to be, um, uh, to pull the side in different, in different ways and had an openness, of course, to people. But I think that that's a far cry from being a people pleaser, which if we we're going to put it in, you know, scriptural terms is kind of being, uh, having the fear of man. I, Cause that's what it is for me, at least is I'm afraid that if I say no, people are going to think I'm mean or I'm not helpful or something like that. And so I think that's, that's absolutely critical is learning to give a gracious no. And, and I think that that it's kind of a skill you have to learn and you have to muscle through it at first, but when someone comes to you with something, instead of telling them yes, and then either failing to do it because you got too much going on or just never following up with them, you just you just affirm what they just say. That sounds like a great thing. That sounds really awesome. And I really hope it's successful. I, I just can't do it. I have to focus on this right now. And everyone yeah. understands that you you yeah. really the funny thing is you people don't often feel let down. They, they don't lose respect for you. Often they gain respect for you from it. And so a lot of our fears about saying no are unfounded, but uh, it is necessary if you're going to live a life of focus. Yeah. Like with all things, technology can be both a blessing and a curse at times. What advice would you have for engaging with technology, but without it controlling you? Yeah, I think this is massive in our day and age. Um, technology is everywhere. Um, you know, it's often called the information age and we're overwhelmed by it. Uh, the funny thing is people think about productivity and you think, tools to help you get more things done, but it is, it's a, it's a double sword. I've, my, I often refer to my phone as a double-edged sword because it can cut me by wasting a bunch of time, but it also can cut for me by helping me get stuff done faster. And so I think a good thing to do is to have rules about technology. Like for example, with, with my phone, um, I have rules. I don't check it before breakfast. Um, I have, I use the, I have an iPhone. I use the screen time function to block certain apps. So I just can't do things that are distracting. Um, I think a big part on the technology side is just the content consumption. Um, your information diet, as some people have called that. I think being wise about what you're consuming, how much you're consuming. It's not just about um, not consuming stuff that's that's sinful or, or things like that, but just not opening the floodgates to the internet and letting them pour their worldview and all this stuff into your, your mind. You really have to be intentional about that. And so I, I, things I tell people is have a read it later app um, so that you can save articles to read later, uh, carve out intentional time when you're on your devices, have a plan for what you're going to do. Don't just veg out in front of your devices. Those things help a lot. Mm -hmm. An important aspect of what you talk about is setting goals. Now, some people that have a high view of the sovereignty of God, which by the way, we both do, may push back against this a little. Why are goals and ambitions okay and even important, Reagan? Yeah, this is a, a thing I run into a lot as I talk about goals, because you know the Bible does talk about vain ambition, ambition that's for your own sake, um, and it does talk about even in James. You know, he talks about uh, you know, come now, you who say we'll we'll go to such and such a town and do business and make trade, and he says you boast in your arrogance by by saying that, but he so they're making plans. And they're being criticized by it. But then he turns around and he says, instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will go here and here and do such and such. He's not, he doesn't condemn ambition or making plans or um, setting goals. It's the attitude that's the problem. And so yeah. I think Christians, I think it's clear in scripture, Christians set goals, we make plans, but we do them with an open hand. Paul, the apostle Paul is, is, I think, the perfect example of this. He's a guy who was filled with zeal, filled with ambition. He actually said, he talks about his ambition, but 
when you look at his missionary journeys, he planned in his letters too. He planned to go to certain places and he, he clearly must have been mapping out how he was going to do it. But sometimes he got redirected. You know, the Macedonian call is one of the the um, the famous ones where he had plans where he was going to go. And the Lord gives him this vision says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so he says, okay, I'm going there. And so I think that attitude is what we should have is be diligent, have focus, make plans, set goals, but don't do them arrogantly. Have an open hand and say, Lord, I want this to please you. And if you have different plans, shut the door, redirect my path. I'm ready to pivot at a moment's notice. Love that. So good. What practical tips do you have for seeking God's will when setting a goal? Yeah, I think obviously, obviously a big one is is prayer, um, praying for wisdom. Again, in James, if anyone of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. Um, yeah. Asking for wisdom for setting goals. Um, I'm not talking about waiting for some mystical sign from heaven, praying and just like sitting around and waiting. Um, you have to exercise wisdom. God's given us brains and he's given us his word. Uh, I think sound counsel talking to elder at your church, pastor, um, other friends, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors and uh, submitting those things to God. Ultimately, when you you have a course, you've taken counsel, you've prayed about it and you commit it to the Lord and say, okay, this is the way I, I think I should go. I'm going to go at a hundred percent, Lord, redirect me um, if necessary. So I, I think those are huge. And then just on the hyper-practical level, you got to make goals that are actually goals. A lot of people call their wishes goals you know they have some vague idea of i want to do this you know the classic one is like i'm going to lose some weight well how much weight and by when and how will you do it that's the thing that really knocks us off from getting our goals done is we stop at having this dream for what we hope to accomplish we stop short and when we really need to press into it and say no 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 what's the plan what am i going to do each week when where why yeah. i think when you put those things together and you've committed to the Lord, they're much more likely to succeed if that's what the Lord has for you. Yeah, really good. Well, well let's talk about that now. So so what are some good tips in regards to the, the mechanics of setting a really good goal? What separates a goal from a from a wish? Yeah, I, I, I'm i paraphrasing. I can't remember who said this, but someone said something that it it really is having a date on it. Is a goal has a deadline um, and that helps us so much is knowing I'm shooting to get this done by this time. Because otherwise, you're just going to keep kicking it down the road. You're going to say, I'm too busy. You've got to add some urgency to it. So that's a huge, huge thing mechanics-wise, getting a, a deadline on your goal. And often having someone else external to you hold you accountable, help you to get it done. Um, I think I talk about this often as well, too, is making sure you understand how your goal sort of fits into the hierarchy of your life. What I mean is if our ultimate goal, I picture this as a pyramid at the top of the pyramid, there is the glory of God. That's our ultimate purpose. Under that is our, what I call our domains of stewardship, the different areas of our life that I kind of alluded to earlier, like our health, our finances. The, and under that is your goals. I have a goal. Which domain does that fit into? And what's the, per how am I, st the, I'm stewarding this domain of my health. And so I have this goal of losing weight. Okay. So I see how by doing this, I'm going to be glorifying God, but then you go a level beneath that and you say, okay, I'm going to make some projects. I'm here's the workout plan I'm going to follow. And then underneath that, you say, okay, what habits I'm going to do? What's the day to day look like every day. And if you trace kind of that pyramid all the way down, you have a plan that goes all the way that, that draws a straight line all the way to your ultimate goal of glorifying God to what you're doing right this moment. And I think that's just really powerful. Yeah. You've done so well to answer that question without saying a smart objective. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> the <tiptoe> around that. <laughs> You've gone on record as saying that 99% of productivity is prioritizing. How do you balance out between your short-term and your long-term goals? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I think that really is the challenge of of day to day prioritizing because you do you do often you're juggling stuff. I remember I worked in IT for a while and one of our problems, we had a small IT department and we did support and we did uh, we called like DevOps. We'd be doing projects to advance the, the company, getting new software. And that was the challenge there, too, is constantly there's emergencies coming. I got to fix this guy's laptop. Oh, this guy has a virus. Oh, wait, we need to do updates on these people's computers. But we need to push this project forward because a year from now, 
we're going to, we're like getting behind every day. And so I think having, having short-term and long-term goals is part of all of life. And as you try to manage that in your personal life, I, I just, uh, it goes back to what I said in the previous answer with your goals. If you traced down a plan to what you need to do each day to make a little progress in your long-term goal, that then just sits alongside your daily tasks. So for example, I'm I'm working on another book right now. And I know that it, I just need to really write for one hour a day. Sometimes it'll go longer. But my task each day, right next to, you know, answer that email or get the milk or all that, I have a, a task and it's the same every day. Put in an hour to write. And if I do that, I know that I have a firm plan that's going to make sure that book gets done on time if I just do that one thing. And so I think having the plan kind of brings everything down to the daily level so that your your short-term tasks and your long-term ones can sit side by side. Yeah, really, really good. I know you encourage people to carry out a weekly review. What does this look like for you and how has this helped you? Yeah, I think I got the idea for weekly review from uh, David Allen. He wrote the classic book, Getting Things Done, which is a great book. It's from a secular pr perspective, but he talks about weekly reviews where basically at the end of each week, you look back and you look at your your calendar, you look how the week went, you look at any unfinished projects and you kind of get everything in order. And so I've borrowed that concept and kind of changed it over the years in my own life. And I do the same thing at the end of each week. I, I do some simple things that are the same each week. I tidy up my workspace. I kind of get it all clean. I make sure that all of my inboxes are cleared out. So my email, if I have any papers on my desk, um, anything like that, that's left undone. I either finish it or make put it into a system that makes sure I'm going to get it next week. You're, you're closing, this is a David Allen term, you're closing all of the open loops. But you're also spending some time to reflect on the previous week. And as a Christian, I think a big part of that is looking back and asking, how did this week go? Was I faithful in these areas? What, what were the things where I feel like it, it's going well? What are the things where I could, I could improve? Um, did I walk closely with the Lord this week? And you're doing these things to kind of force yourself. And I do this in a journal, these reflection questions. You're forcing yourself to really be intentional about how you're living each week. And then mm -hmm. just by doing that, you will naturally start to make tweaks to your life each week um, because you're thinking about it. And and then the wonderful thing about it is you can go in. I do mine on Fridays, but you can go into the weekend with a clear head. Like I don't, right. I do that with my work stuff. And so when I go into the weekend, I don't think about work at all. I turn off my computer and I don't check it again because I know everything's dealt with, or at least I left myself some breadcrumbs so I can deal with it on Monday. Yeah, really good. Really, really good. Reagan, you can look at people like Joel BK and here's <laughs> someone that seems to have read every single Puritan book, every published, every new book that comes out. And he seems to write a new book every other week as well. What am I doing wrong? How can we find time to study, but also have an effective ministry at the same time? Well, I don't. I don't think that Joel Beaky sleeps. I think. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, he's got some sort of a superpower. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Guys like him, I think um, they're they're just they they have superpowers. I once heard somebody refer to uh, to Charles Spurgeon as a freak of grace. You've heard the term freak of nature. You know, they said a freak of yeah. grace, someone who's just yeah, yeah. extraordinarily blessed. I think some people are. And I do actually, I mean that I, I take comfort in that because, you know, back to the parable of the talents, part of that parable, Matthew 25, is that the stewards were entrusted with differing amounts. We have differing gifts from God to be stewarded. We're not all mega minds like Joel Beakey and Joel Beakey doesn't have all of the gifts, you know, natural or spiritual either. He has different things where I'm sure he's deficient. And so I think that um, there's wisdom in appreciating people that kind of are, are are doing things at like a superior level. And there's wisdom in, in trying to strive to do that. But there's also some wisdom in recognizing I have limits. I have often differing responsibilities than that person. And that's okay. I'm going to be faithful in this. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, ask for God's help. I'm going to seek to be productive in where the Lord's put me, but uh, I don't have to be exactly like that person. So I think that that's that's sort of part A. I think the other thing is how do we find time to study and be effective at the same time? Like it is it is a balance. Yes. Um 
a big a big thing. I don't know if you're gonna ask me about this. A big thing I talk about is morning routines. That is why I wake up early. And I I get up, I'm not recommending this to anyone, but I get up at 4 30 a.m. because I go to bed at nine. So I sleep for seven and a half hours. So it's it's enough sleep. But I get up that early so that I have time to be undistracted because I think it's a really precious thing. And that's when I read. Uh I read I have two little kids, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And so I do not have a lot of time to myself, <laughs> uh, but that time nobody's awake. I can study. I can kind of prepare for the day. And so I think whether that's a morning routine or some other time, carving out a specific set amount of time for read, reading, for study, any of those things you need, that really is uh, a key to sort of letting that become a habit, letting it compound over time. And you just be shocked at how many books you can get through in a year just by having 30 minutes or an hour that you're reading every single day. Yeah. So good. Really, really helpful. There are some people that fall into a ditch on the other side of being productive. And that's when complacency has crept in and they've become lazy. If you were speaking to that person now, how would you help them press that reset button reset button? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think that comes down to your theology. It, it does. There does need to be a reset. There needs to be a wake up call. Um, I think a lot of times people fall into complacency for several several reasons, but they really boil down to a lack of mission, a lack of focus. And that can happen in, you know, maybe your your job just feels all over the place. You're thinking, what's the point? A lot of times it happens to people that are going through major transitions in life. Um, a lot of people that I work with are retirees or empty nesters, and they've gone through this this phase where their whole focus was on raising their kids or on their job. And now that's over. And they're like, well, what's what do I do? And so I, I think the the reset button is is going again down that pyramid saying, okay, my purpose is to glorify God. That's my ultimate purpose. But what what right now? What is the thing that I can do right now? How can I steward the gifts God's given me in this season of life in a unique way? And sometimes that's your vocation, like your main calling in life, whether it's your job or, or being a homemaker or something. But sometimes it's it's something in your church. You know, you're in, you're in a job, you you have to be there and you're tr having trouble connecting that to your bigger purpose, but you're leaving a men's group at your church or you're discipling some young ladies or something. That, that can be the thing that sort of reorients you. And so I guess all, all I'm trying to say is you've got to realign your thinking to your purpose, recognize that if you're alive right now, that means God still has work for you to walk in in this life. And so let's let's get to work. Let's figure that out and let's ask for his help and and get going, because this is not this isn't heaven yet. This is not this isn't time. We do need rest. But I mean, it's not time to slacken up and pretend that there's there's nothing left to do. There's still work. Yeah. What are we not teaching our kids about productivity, Reagan? If you could go back and speak to the, the 10 year old Reagan Rose, what would you tell him? Yeah, I think it's a similar thing to what I just said. You exist to glorify God that, you know, this is a big thing in reformed theology. I've seen the glory of God. You know, it's the, the first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That was or when, when I got introduced to reformed theology, that shattered my world. Because it was suddenly this connecting principle. Uh, I I often think that one of the most overlooked blessings of the Christian life, you know, obviously we're saved from our sins. We were given every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We we have eternal hope of being with Christ forever. We have all these wonderful blessings. But one of the blessings we often forget is the blessing of purpose. Most of the world, if you think about this, if you've been a Christian for a while, you don't think about this that much, but most of the world has no idea why they're here. They're just making up what their purpose is. I think I'm here for this. And the next week, maybe it's this. I know why I'm here. I know who I am. That changes everything. And I often tell people, if you get this right, if you start to understand your purpose to glorify God, you'll figure out the details. You will you will hunt down, how do I manage my time? Because there are answers. There's help for how to do that practical stuff. But you got to nail the theology. Why am I here? Who am I? If you get that, the rest will follow. And so I, I would tell 10-year-old myself that, Hey, put, put down the controller. <laughs> you that yeah. that's great. You know that's wonderful. But at some point, you're going to need to uh, you're going to need to grow up, and you're going to need to um, to to live for Christ. Yeah. In your new book, you talk about how our perspective on suffering is transformed as we see trials as God's pruning for greater productivity. Tell us about that, Reagan. Yeah, you know that that also comes from John 15, and 
Jesus talking about how he's the vine and we are the branches. Um, and he talks in there about how every branch that, that does not bear fruit, he cuts off and throws in the fire. Right. But then right after that, he says, but the branches that do grow fruit, he prunes them that they might bear more. And I do believe that he's talking about the trials of life, the testing of our faith, because remember the, the, the source for our productivity is our connection to the vine. And how are we connected to Christ? By faith. And so those trials, that pruning, that testing of our faith increases our reliance, our connection, our recognition that I can do nothing apart from Christ. So when those hard times come, I, if you see those as what they really are, a cause of rejoicing, again, James 1 talks about this, a cause to, to have joy because look, if my goal is to glorify God and I do that through bearing much fruit for him, then this trial is an opportunity for me to become more fruitful. Lord, bring it on. Give me grace to, to endure it, but grow me through this so that I can be a more effective branch on this vine. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Reagan, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Before we let you go, do you have any closing thoughts? Just that it's it's worth it. It's not a, I often tell people this, that productivity can be a scary word. It's not about being as busy as you can possibly be. It's about leading a life of purpose, intent on glorifying God. It It is the most meaningful, joyful life you can live when you start to line things up in your life so that you have this awareness that all that I'm doing, I really am trying to make it all live towards God's glory. It's not just a platitude. I'm not just saying all of life for the glory of God. I'm actually intentionally trying to aim my life that way. It's It's the most enjoyable, wonderful thing you could do. Um, and, and yeah, if you, you want to follow my work, all of it, you can be found on redeemingproductivity.com. Uh, the book is the same name, Redeeming Productivity. Uh, that's on Amazon or Moody Publishers and lots of different places. But if you just go to the website, redeemingproductivity.com, you can find everything I'm doing. Well, we'll make sure that we've got the links to the podcast and to the book in the description below. If you've enjoyed this conversation, then Reagan, this is just a tip of the iceberg of all of the golden nuggets that reagan shares every time he pushes out a new podcast reagan thanks again so much for your time and for your ministry as well really really thankful for you thank you david it was a blessing to be with you Thanks.